Good afternoon and welcome to everybody to the first of this year's seminar on open science organized by the Italian Reproducibility Network. I am Cristina Zogmeister and I am a psychologist and psychometrician based at the University of Milan Bicocca and member of the Italian Reproducibility Network Steering Committee. Uh, we are now, today we are beginning our second cycle of seminars and uh, I want to begin by thanking all of the people that have contributed so far uh, and will contribute also in the future in this year uh, seminars. So first of all, the incredible speakers that we had uh, in the past and the ones that will contribute in the, this year. The educational work group of uh, ITRN, so Vittorio Iacovella, Michela Vezzoli, Ezia Rizzi, Federica Conte, Gabriele Fusco. The IAP, the Italian Association of Psychology, that uh, supported us uh, last year and uh, will provide support also during uh, this year. And uh, by the way, all of uh, the previous seminars, the one of last year, are all uh, still available online on our YouTube channel. So if you missed any of them last year, I suggest seeing them on uh, YouTube. And I also uh, suggest you to subscribe to our uh, YouTube uh, channel so you, you will stay updated with uh, all uh, the contents that we will post there. And we, you will also uh, help us uh, grow our channel. And of course, if you are interested in open science, if you want to be part of uh, a community focused on open science, uh, feel free to subscribe to our network uh, if you haven't already. And uh, okay, some um, little bit of information about the structure of the seminars for those who did not uh, take part of, in the ones of uh, last year. The presentation will take approximately 45 minutes, followed by time for questions. If you want to ask a question, please indicate it in the chat. You can either uh, write the question in the chat or just write the word question. Uh, if you write the question, you will, uh, uh, we will give you the floor and you will uh, be able to ask it directly to the speaker. Otherwise, if you prefer, you can just uh, write down the question in the chat and we will uh, read it aloud to, uh, to the speaker. Uh, if you are a student, please uh, write in the chat also the word student. For instance, if you want to ask a question, you can write the uh, student and then question. And uh, this is important, why? Because uh, um, of course, all people interested, all persons interested in uh, uh, open science and reproducibility are very welcome to our seminars, but uh, they are conceived specifically for PhD students. Uh, because in ITRN, we believe that uh, the academically younger people can be the driver for the improvement of the way of doing science. And for this reason, question for, um, from uh, the students will take the president, the president. So will be, uh, students will be uh, provided the opportunity to ask the questions before uh, other people. Um, I think that uh, I provided all the most the important information before uh, general information. Now it's uh, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, uh, Valentina Pasquale. Uh, thank you uh, very much for being here, Valentina. And uh, yeah, um, welcome to. Good afternoon. This, uh, Good afternoon. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Um, Valentina Pasquale has a background in bioengineering and neuroscience with a PhD in uh, humanoid technologies. She is a specialist in uh, research data management and at the Italian Institute of Technology and coordinates uh, the support to scientists in data management and open science. So uh, Valentina, the floor is yours. Thank you again. So thank you. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share my screen. Please confirm that you can see um, the presentation full screen. Yes, we do. OK. Very good. OK. And the slides advancing, right? OK, good. Yes. 
So, uh, well, the title of uh, my presentation today is about the transformative potential of open science. So it will be a general introduction uh, to the notion uh, of, of open science with some practical examples. Uh, so first of all, uh, the license uh, for, for these lights that can be found in Zenodo at this DOI. And the license is an open one and it is the CC BY share alike license. Uh, and uh, where not specifically specified, uh, well, the images are taken from Unsplash and used uh, within an open uh, license. Uh, so uh, Christina uh, already uh, told you something uh, about uh, my background and my experience. Uh, well, I, I wanted to tell you that um, I was a PhD student uh, myself uh, in the um, late 2007, so between 2007 and 2010. And uh, I was doing research uh, in the field of neuroscience. Uh, I was passionate about uh, data analysis, data management also in general since uh, PhD studies. And my background is uh, in bioengineering. And uh, now that I told you uh, who uh, I am, uh, I would like to know more uh, about the audience. So I invite you to go to uh, the website of Mentimeter, uh, www.menti.com, use the code 547132, or uh, just um, use the QR code that is in the slide. And uh, please, uh, well, take some time to answer to the two questions. So let me switch to, um, okay, to the Mentimeter. I hope you now see, okay, the results uh, of the first uh, Menti question. That is, what is your broad research domain? Very broad, okay, because you, you only have three choices, basically. Life sciences, social sciences, and humanities and physical science, uh, sciences and engineering uh, or other. Okay, no engineers, <laughs> okay. Okay, so most uh, of you, uh, I understand you come from social science and humanities and life sciences, okay. So that is interesting to, to know for me, also to get an idea of, of the people that, uh, that form the audience of today. Okay, very good. So 30, 35 answers so far. I'll wait a little bit more uh, to see if more answers are coming. Okay, I think we can go to the, to the second question. That is, why do you do research? So why did you uh, decide to undertake uh, a PhD? Well, I, I have tried to, to list uh, possible reasons uh, among, uh, well, just because you like it, uh, because you want to satisfy your curiosity, because you are ambitious, because you would like to create new knowledge for the world of the future, to respond to societal needs and global challenges. Okay, one, one answer so far, just passion, okay? Please don't be shy, any, any answer is possible, okay? Curiosity, I'm a very curious person. Improve psychological health and create new methodologies. Passion, curiosity, work, create new, no new knowledge. Really fond of neuroscience improve available treatments in movement disorders, knowledge and curiosity, investigate the inner aspects of a disease, societal needs. Okay, I think that, well, maybe we have, we can say that we have about two categories of answers. One is more, you know, uh, personal motivation, okay? Curiosity, fun, passion, because I like it, 
okay, this kind of motivation that is more about you. And the other one is about the others, about the, the impact, about the benefit that other people can get from, uh, from the work that you do. So these are, I think, uh, the basis uh, of, of, of the motivation that, that, drives, um, that drives researchers, okay? So very good, very, very interesting for me. And I think we can, and, and for you too, I think, and I think we can go on with the, with the presentation now. So this is the outline of today. So first I would like to set the context and to give you a motivation for open science. Why are we here today? Why uh, is it useful and needed to talk about open science to young generations of, of, of researchers? Uh, then we will see, we will try to define open science, give formal definitions uh, of what open science is, and we will find, uh, we'll, we will see in at the end of the presentation, uh, a few examples of open science in action. And uh, finally, what just one slide for the conclusions. Okay. So we start with the first part of this lecture, setting the context, why open science? And uh, in order to do that, uh, I would like to really start from my personal experience, okay? So uh, I told you that uh, I used to be a PhD student like you are, and my first research article uh, was, uh, well, a study of uh, analysis of the uh, network dynamics of cortical dissociated neurons plated on top of microelectrode arrays, planar microelectrode arrays. And uh, well, it was both the result uh, of my master degree thesis and of the first part of my PhD, and it's about 14 years ago. And uh, when I was uh, preparing the slides for this lecture, I started to ask myself, uh, so what about uh, the data that uh, resulted, where that, that supported the findings reported in this article? Eh? What, where are these data now? Okay, where are today the data supporting my findings. And well, uh, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I'm not sure 100% where the data and the code uh, are today, okay? Because at that time, there was no mandatory, for example, data availability statement to include in articles. Authors were uh, normally not required to share data or code supporting uh, their findings. That was the normal, okay? But nowadays, it is not like that anymore, okay? And, and we will see why. Uh, but let's try to answer this question. Where are the data today? Well, the raw data are somewhere in the lab at the University of Genova, where I did my PhD. Uh, at that time, we used to store the raw data in CDs or DVDs. And I'm pretty sure that at least some of them are not readable anymore because just well, you know, obsolescence of, uh, of the support. And the metadata about the experiments were tracked on paper sheets, hopefully, hopefully, I don't know, still preserved in lab in ring binders stored in closets. And they were uh, saved in uh, the original uh, format of the acquisition system that was produced by the company multi-channel systems. So it's a proprietary format. Well, the code and the analyzed data a little bit better. I have this uh, well in portable hard drives, uh, in which I have partly at home and partly at IIT in well somewhere in a box where I have all my old stuff, and and also uh, the analyses were uh, run in MATLAB, so they they are saved in proprietary MATLAB format. So uh, well, just to conclude, 15, 14 years have passed. It's not such a long time, but the original research data are basically not accessible anymore and uh, nobody can reuse them, okay? And you start to understand that, well, uh, globally taken, well, this is a problem. And in the long term, uh, of course, uh, this is going to be, uh, well, a huge problem for the reusability and the reproducibility of science. And that's because data are fragile, okay? Uh, already in 2013 and 2014, 
uh, well, this um, study tried to quantify uh, the how the availability of research data declines uh, in time. And we all know that it declines very rapidly with the article age. So the data that are produced today, if you don't do anything to preserve them and uh, to make them reusable in the long term, they will be the 80 percent of that will be lost in 20 years. And that was exactly what happened to the data that supported my first uh, research article. OK, and but does this system work? Well, uh, not quite. Um, so the Nature magazine interviewed in 2016 more than 1500 researchers on the reproducibility of science. They were asked uh, if they uh, well, you know, they believed uh, that there was a reproducibility crisis in science and the answer for the large majority of them was yes, there is a strong reproducibility crisis in science. And when asked uh, about what factors contribute to irreproducible research, so the top rated factors uh, are about the pressure to publish, the selective reporting of positive results, and also the unavailability in the long term of raw data methods code from the original laboratories. Okay, so we start to understand that the pressure to publish and to publish in high impact factor journals has produced a deep reproducibility crisis that is also acknowledged by the researchers themselves. Okay. Um, so, um, Another uh, practical example, uh, maybe more even more significant than uh, my personal experience and my personal example, and that was uh, already mentioned by um, Brian Nozick, if I remember, last year uh, during uh, these webinar series, okay, is about the final outputs of the reproducibility project that were released at the end of last year. And the project is actually was actually a collaboration between the Center for Open Science and Science Exchange. The aim of this uh, project was to assess uh, reproducibility in cancer biology by trying to replicate independently select experiments from a number of high profile papers in the field of cancer biology. And to me, the results uh, were um, unbelievable, astonishing. So out of 53 papers considered, just 23 could be put to test because of the unavailability of methods, of tools, of data, and the lack of collaboration from the original laboratories. Only five papers could be fully reproduced and confirmed, and three just partly. So of course, this does not tell us that cancer biology is flawed in general, or that the results were not valid, but is indicative of how deep is this uh, reproducibility crisis. Hmm? And so let's make a step behind and, and we let's try to come back to what are the functions of scholarly communication, okay? So uh, if we think about the research articles, uh, well, since the 17th century, the, the scholarly communication, so the way scientists communicate their results to their peers has taken the form of letters, of articles. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first uh, journal was published by the Royal Society of Chemistry, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and, um, and, and the main function was not only to communicate results and science, was only to get recognition and the certification of research uh, validity and also for well archiving purposes but uh, well in the last uh, say after the advent of the, of the digital age um, another function was added on top of scholarly communication that is reward because scientists researchers also you as students are assessed evaluated based on 
uh, your um, publications, okay? The results that you put into scientific articles. Uh, and that's because scholarly communication in academia evolved uh, under the paradigm of publish or perish, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar or at least uh, heard uh, at least once about, well, this concept or paradigm of publish or perish that forces researchers to publish uh, many papers um, because they are evaluated actually on the number of papers, on the number of citations, uh, and they are also evaluated uh, based on the publishing venue, so the journal where the results are presented. In a single word, they are uh, evaluated based on bibliometric indicators. Um, I'm not sure how much this uh, well, is found in the field of, of humanities, of social sciences and humanities, but of, for sure it is in life sciences and in physical sciences and engineering uh, domains. Um, for those of you who don't know what the impact factor is, because you see that we mentioned here the impact factor of journals, well, the impact factor reflects the yearly mean number of citations of articles published in the last two years in a given journal. So it is actually a mean number, an average number that tells you something about, you know, how much uh, a journal is read and, and cited, of course, but actually it doesn't tell you anything on a quality uh, of each single article because it is an average measure. And but it is frequently used as a proxy for the relative importance of a journal within its field and journals with higher impact factor values are given a status of being more important and carry more prestige in their respective fields than those with lower values and so also the articles published in high impact factor journals are regarded as uh, um, well, reporting results with higher impact and higher quality, but this is not always uh, the case, actually. Hmm? Evaluation has become an obsession for research, but when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And the main effect is that researchers because they are, you know, they are human people. They started to gain the system at every level in order to be able to publish in high impact factor journals. And that, of course, produced a dysfunctional research culture, okay? Uh, for example, this is a very, very recent, uh, well, example. This is an, well, an editorial about an article that uh, was uh, published in another journal uh, uh, where authors claims basically that in paleontology, also the pressure to publish is fueling illegal, uh, well, if not unethical practices uh, like, uh, um, you know, the, um, the theft of, uh, you know, uh, fossils, for example, from one country to another one and so on, okay? Uh, and uh, um, another slide that I would like to remind you always from uh, the presentation of last year by Brian Nozick is that all of this all of this produced a dysfunctional research culture. The incentives for individual success uh, are focused on getting it published, not on getting it right. And those incentives to publish novel, positive, tidy results in high impact journals have created and promoted a dysfunctional research culture in which the scientists tend to select the results based on their novelty, based on their potential impact. Studies are generally poorly transparent. The data, for example, underlying the studies are not shared because of the high competition, the researchers tend not to collaborate, not to share data and tools and to work together. The replication studies also are not rewarded because they do not present anything novel, so they are not very common. And the outcome of all this is that research became progressively less credible by the society in general, less reproducible, also less impactful, okay? People do not believe in science anymore as it was before, okay? 
But is that really the science that we need? We have poor reproducibility, selective reporting, no supporting data. Um, so the right question to ask now for me is, is that what we need for the world uh, of, of the future that we want, okay, for the future of our world? So for those and other reasons, an ongoing movement promoting a different way of doing science started to arise and all this goes under the umbrella of open science. Hmm? Uh, in a few words, just in a, sense, in a sentence, open science is just science but done in the right way. There is no difference between open science and good science, okay? And a good science should be also inspired by values like quality, transparency, collective benefit, inclusiveness, as we will see afterwards, okay? So basically this concludes the part uh, about motivations for open science. OK, and uh, I, I hope that now I have convinced you that something has to change, OK, in the way uh, science is communicated and, and shared and presented to the world. So we go on with the, uh, with the discovery of actually what is open science. Open science is a very broad and general terms that may uh, well point to a different to different things, okay, and different interpretation also. Hmm? So, um, well, let's see a couple of definitions that come from the website of the Open Air Project and also from the uh, website of the Foster Project. Bo both of these projects were, well, say, dedicated to open science and to policy making uh, in open science uh, and also training. So, open science actually describes an ongoing uh, change in the way research is performed. Uh, in the way researchers collaborate, knowledge is shared and science is organized and is frequently defined as an umbrella term uh, that involves various movements aiming to remove the barriers for sharing any kind of output, resource, method, tools at any stage of the research process. So actually, we start to understand that open science includes, includes many uh, different uh, practices, and it really involves the whole research process, not only the final stage of publishing and dissemination. And that was beautifully uh, summarized and uh, and also uh, you know um, motivated in the recent UNESCO recommendation on open science. Uh, well, this is a recommendation that was uh, adopted last year unanimously by all 193 member states uh, of UNESCO, and that is a great contribution to defining what open science is and which actions should be undertaken by all states to promote a better understanding and adoption of open science. Okay. And uh, the the motto, the you know the, um, the the statement that summarizes best is setting global standards for open science for all. Okay, and uh, in this document we find a, a very formal and comprehensive definition of open science, which I like uh, a lot, uh, and that includes also elements of the other definitions that I showed to you. And open science uh, is based on four main pillars, uh, which can be regarded as enabling factors or core practices, namely open scientific knowledge, open infrastructures, open engagement of societal actors, and also open dialogue between and uh, different knowledge systems. And the final goal of open science practices is to make scientific knowledge available, accessible and reusable to everyone in the long term for the global benefit. Okay. And uh, these are the core values 
and the guiding principles of open science as they are reported in the UNESCO recommendation. And I also added some examples of how these can be realized and achieved. Uh, open science, of course, is grounded on research excellence, on integrity, on transparency, on reproducibility, also on academic freedom. But we have to keep in mind uh, that uh, well, the assessment of research quality should be based on transparency uh, through rigorous and open uh, peer reviews that consider the whole research process and not the final product, just the final product that is the final research article. At the same time, Collaboration, participation, inclusion, uh, diversity should drive science, okay? Uh, diversity of disciplines, of cultures, of knowledge systems, of practices, of workflows, of languages, and so on, and so on, okay? So these are just to give you the flavor of how complex it is to define open science and how broad is this uh, ongoing change in the way research is done and performed, okay? So it is not just open access to publications, okay? It's not just paying for making your articles open access and that's it, or it's not, it's just not, you know, taking your data and deposit them in a repository without no metadata, with no information about uh, how the studies could be, let's say, reproduced, for example. So open scientific knowledge is realized, so not only by opening access, but also with the new ways of performing science and of sharing data and includes data, source code, software, educational resources, hardware, and so on. So um, I would like just to focus on three main aspects, okay? So three, three statements that I want you to remind about uh, open science. So the first one is about the fact that dissemination should not only be focused on scientific articles. The second one is about data. Data should always be responsibly managed also when they are not open. And the third one is about evaluation. You should all know that you deserve an evaluation and assessment grounded on quality and impact, and that considers all different kinds of scientific contributions and activities, not only just looking at your research articles and the impact factor of the publishing venues, okay? Um, so about the flavors of open science, I already anticipated that to you. You can make your work, your workflow more open in many, many different ways at every stage of the research process or, you know, the research cycle, okay? By practicing open access, by practicing open peer review, by using open formats, by sharing your data, by sharing your protocols, by using open tools, open source code, and, and so on. So, uh, really open science has many different flavors and all of these flavors, all of these products should be considered as contributions uh, actually to science and to the process of, of discovery. Um, about the data, so uh, at, since the very start of your PhD, you should uh, understand and, and be aware that the data that you produce are very important and must be preserved in the long term. So in 2016, um, in this uh, paper that was published in Scientific Data, uh, they, uh, the authors proposed what they called fair guiding principles for I would add responsible scientific data management and stewardship. The so-called FAIR principles. FAIR is an acronym and goes under the name, well, and is an acronym and stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it is important to understand that data should be fair, not only for humans, 
not only for human readers, but also for machines and algorithms. So another possible interpretation of the FAIR principles is that the data should be fully AI ready, so immediately ready for artificial intelligence applications. So the FAIR principles emphasize the machine actionability, um, the capacity of computational systems to find, access, interoperate, and reuse data with none or minimal human intervention because humans increasingly rely on computational support to deal with data as a result of the increase in volume, complexity, and the creation speed of data. So it is important that also research data are fair and possibly produced FAIR till the very beginning. So the so-called FAIR by design, okay? I could, you know, give an entire speech on that, but it's just to give you, you know, uh, some uh, suggestions, okay? And some, you know, also reading suggestions for uh, on, on, on this very broad uh, topic of open science and data management. And finally, about research assessment, um, uh, well, very recently, this Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment was, was formed, has been formed. Uh, it includes uh, many funders, institutions, uh, scientific associations, all committed to change the way research is assessed and evaluated. And on top of the slide, I reported uh, uh, some of the principles underlying the the document uh, that expresses, you know, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. So the principles are, uh, you know, to focus research assessment criteria on quality and impact of research. And that means recognize the diversity of research activities and practices, the diversity of outputs and reward early sharing and open collaboration and open science practices. Value the skills competencies, merits of individual researchers, but at the same time also recognize the team science and the collaboration. And this COARA document uh, specifies a series of core commitments and supporting commitments and a timeline for funders and institutions to uh, demonstrate the achievements of those goals. And uh, I'm happy to say that in Italy, uh, Anvar signed uh, this, this document, IIT did it, CNR did it, uh, and, and many others are, you know, um, now considering to do it. And it is really, really a global ongoing movement towards a different way of uh, evaluating research. But are there unwanted effects on that? Are there shortcomings? Yes, of course. Uh, we should pay attention to the way those ideals, you do, those goals are, are reached. Because open science, if done wrong, will compound new inequities, OK? Uh, so I invite you to have a look at the output uh, of this project that is called On Merit. If I remember correctly, there was a presentation about that also last year in the uh, Open Science Webinar cycle, if I remember, if I'm not wrong. And just to give you an example, uh, well, participation in open access publishing, so the possibility to pay APCs to publish open access appears to be skewed towards scholars that have greater access to resources and job security, of course. So if we just push the open access at well, you know, at every at every cost, yet we will compound uh, new inequities and and of course we will not reach the objectives that we would like to reach. So to make science more inclusive and and uh, and uh, and uh, and to create really a benefit for everyone for all. Okay, with open science. And uh, finally, I would like to conclude with uh, some examples of open science research in action. I start with the most obvious, that, that is, you know, COVID-19. Uh, well, when in um, March 2020, we began to realize that we were at the beginning of a really, really global pandemics, 
the scientific publishers immediately decided to make coronavirus content freely available and reusable immediately, okay, with no, um, with no fee to pay uh, for publishing or reading articles about COVID-19, okay. And well, uh, me uh, well i was i was happy about that as all other people that you know um, are work in in the field of of open science because we we saw this uh, as as a rapid positive change towards open science so, so we were we we believed that the new era was coming about uh, well how uh, science is shared and communicated okay uh, because the scientists rapidly changed their way of collaborating and sharing research data and findings because there was this strong drive of finding a cure or finding a vaccine or finding a solution against really this global uh, uh, problem. And we all know that open science approaches have greatly contributed to the fight against the pandemics. Uh, let's think about uh, all the, well, you know, millions of genetic sequences of the virus that were um, uh, shared in, in Gizade. We had about 100 sequences uploaded in January 2020 and then 1 million in April 2021 and now I think we are uh, we reached about 30 million okay we all know that this is important because we can for example uh, you know anticipate uh, outbreaks uh, or study new variants and and build a lot of applications on top of that so we we really can say that open science saves uh, lives but now the question comes, why only for COVID-19? Why not for cancer? Why not for dementia? Why not for climate change research? These are all important problems. Uh, well, you know, these are all important questions for uh, the benefit of our world, okay? So now I, I leave you with these questions. Basically, there is no, 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 you know, uh, reasonable um, motivation to say that science should stay closed, okay, and not open. And uh, by changing a little bit field, uh, I would like just to mention this uh, this project that is called Open Street Map. Uh, this, this is another example of open science in action. Uh, well, I came to discover this project, uh, um, thanks to uh, Professor Maria Antonia Brovelli that came uh, to Genova at the beginning of this month because we organized a round table uh, during the Festival della Scienza. And she talked uh, about uh, her uh, research activity and she mentioned OpenStreetMap. That is a, a platform. Actually, it is a community of mappers, of citizens that contributes and maintain uh, and let's say, an open Google Maps, okay, with open data about um, roads, uh, pathways, railway stations, uh, and, uh, uh, and everything else, so geographically referenced data all over the world, okay? And the important thing is that this, this, you know, this database, because actually it is a database, is built by the citizens and it is open for all because it is open data. And imagine how many uh, uh, projects, how many useful applications could be built on top of that. So if you go to the humanitarian open street map team website, you will find many of them. This is just an example, okay, of a project trying to empower the women and the girls to create uh, geographically referenced gender data about issues that affect their lives. This is much important in less developed countries in which uh, the, the safety and the health of women in, in many, many cases is really threatened. Okay. Um, Okay, and last example about open science in action, I hope I, I don't go too long, is about, well, climate change re research, research on biodiversity. This is another citizen science project that is called PlantNet and is available as an app that you can, well, just uh, install on your mobile. And it helps you identify plants uh, thanks to uh, your pictures. And actually the data that are collected by PlantNet 
are also open data and many, many uh, research articles have been already published by using this open data, uh, for example, on the study of biodiversity, how this is affected by climate change. We all know that this is really an important issue and, and, and global challenge to be tackled. Okay, so now we are at the end. This is my conclusion slide that I borrowed uh, from uh, Paola Mazuzzo because I liked it very much. And, and so I would like to propose it again to you. Um, and to me, it clarifies actually what is the transformative potential of open science. Uh, in other words, to put science back at the art of society. Uh, first, we should redefine uh, research excellence, reporting the values at the center. We should recognize that papers and manuscripts are not the only product of the scientific work, and we should stop focusing just on the outputs, but also consider the practice, the process that brought to that output, valuing the failures as an essential step towards the production of new knowledge. And we should invest also in tools, services, initiatives that broaden the participation to science uh, and also enable science really to benefit humanity as a whole. So I think this is a beautiful way to conclude and I would like to uh, thank you for your attention today. Thank you a lot, Valentina, uh, for your very rich and convincing uh, presentation. Uh, I really uh, hope that uh, this is, is giving us uh, motivation to be even more uh, careful in doing open science, in, do, in doing reproduci reproducible science. And I also think that we, uh, even, even if this, the individual person has not that much power, each of us can uh, push also the other people to do more open science. For instance, when we act as uh, reviewers, um, I, I think uh, some of the people who are listening today, they are PhD students, so maybe they, uh, they have not yet uh, doing, uh, worked as reviewers, for instance, but uh, they will from most probably in the future. And when we are doing, when we are reviewers, we can ask to the authors, we can really push them to, to be more open, to share the data, to, uh, to be more explicit in their methods and, and all of this stuff can, can really help uh, in the going for science going in the, in the in the right direction. So thank you. It was, uh, at least I felt uh, your talk very motivational. Thank you. Um, if you have questions, please let, you, let us know so we can ask them to Valentina or you can ask them yourself. There are some raised hands by Davide and Marco. Maybe we can start with them. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Two very quick points more than question. Um, uh, Valentina, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your talk. I think it was very, very nice. Uh, one is a very quick note. I put it in the in the in the um, in the chat, but I wanted to say it out loud uh, because I think it's a very, very important point that the uh, ITRN is also among the signers of the Coara agreement. We were just in time to be part of next week uh, meeting, which is sort of officially launching the work of the of the of Coara. So we're very, very happy of this, and I think it's it's important information for everybody to know. Um, that was one thing. The second thing was a very quick note on something you said, and I very much liked at the end, um, which is related to the failures that we face when we do research. Failures in a good sense, right? So attempt that made sense and just didn't work. Uh, one thing that I'm starting to push my students to do, and I always have our time convincing them, is to put these failures, for example, in their PhD thesis, which to me would be, I mean, if I were the reviewer, I would be super happy and I would value the work of the student much more if I could see the false tracks that were followed, the way that they decided to go in that direction, 
and the reason why they decided to abandon it in the end. Because if everything is done properly, so again, it made sense. So there were reasons to embark into that given project. And then at some point you were honest enough with yourself and the world to realize that that was a, a failed attempt and you just gave up and you explained why you gave up. Um, yeah, this to me would be fantastic. It would be a double pluses, more than a psych science paper. So I'm, I, I was just, just wanted to say this publicly for all the PhD students around that don't assume that the logic that everybody will use to evaluate your work is the dominant logic that you will find in uh, you know in journals that are known to spread back practices. There's there's many people that are starting to change their mind about how research is evaluated, and one thing that you know up until maybe five ten years ago was always to be hidden with the greatest possible force, which is what you tried and didn't work. Now could actually turn the other way around and become a very a very good strength of uh, whatever package of work you you want to share uh, with your colleagues, especially senior colleagues. Yeah, thanks, thanks. I could not agree more. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I have one one comment I wanted to make. It's uh, about the data management. I think this is one of the things we are lagging behind most, at, at least in my personal experience, I guess. Because whereas in, in some other aspects of the research, it's up to the researcher to set new standards. I have the feeling that if I'm not pushed or at least nudged by some systemic incentive um, or, 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 or infrastructure. I mean, if we don't have infrastructures in our universities to handle data differently, for example, as they used to do in the UK, it, it's very hard to get, to get started. So I think that this is something that we should uh, push, uh, we should push um, and, um, and uh, ask maybe the policymakers or at least our universities to start building infrastructures also to speed up this other part of the process, which again, I think it's the one we're lagging behind the most. And then I have also a second um, question about the, I think that the COVID-19 example as an example in how, about how open science can work and increase knowledge, it's a, is really an excellent one. And I really like also the, the fact that that may be set as an example also for other fields. Um, but there is one thing I, I think that didn't really work well uh, in the open science process during COVID-19, which, which was about the preprints. Uh, because I think that in, um, at least in Italy, in the media, uh, a lot of, um, um, for, uh, let's say, wrong ideas that came up and were discussed in the media came from preprints that were too hastily uh, and uh, received by the media and uh, and um, and uh, drove the public debate in a direction that maybe was to uh, was a bit premature because then some of these preprints when they went through the peer review process which has its um, pitfalls of course but at least grants some level of standards then these preprints came out completely different from from the beginning. So, uh, and the the preprint thing, I think, is is one of the things I still don't have my mind completely clear about because I'm all in favor. But there is some don't don't you think that sometimes there is the risk that the when it comes to the public outreach, preprints can also do some harm. So I I start from uh, from the second uh, from the second part uh, of your of your question let's say of your speech um, yeah sure um, I I I think that it's it's evident that there can be a potential problem with preprints and and science that is shared before it is it does actually be scrutinized by by peer review uh, well i i think that there are two components one is the you know one is how these 
preprints or will early shared results uh, reach uh, other scientists because well you know uh, other scientists researchers are somewhat aware uh, that um, preprints have not been uh, uh, peer reviewed uh, before uh, being shared so somewhat you know they they already feel let's say the warning that they should take these results with with caution at, at least but i think that it could be uh, good in the context uh, of well phd training to introduce some uh, more elements of, of critical thinking, okay? If, if you if you understand what I mean with that. So when I was a PhD student, I remember that, well, the, the main concept that, that passed was, oh, you know, it's been published in nature, it's been published in science, it must be good, okay? Uh, instead, it's published on, you know, um, in, uh, well, a less, um, a less prestigious journal. So let's take it with some, you know, uh, doubts and let's try to understand if it's really true or not. Okay. And well, I think that in the end, uh, well, it's not, you, you know, the venue, the journal or well, the, the well, the peer review, of course, it helps. But in, in many cases, well, you, we know that uh, when a paper is peer reviewed is just you, the opinion of a couple of scientists that it can be reliable or not so the students must be taught or should be taught to you know uh, trying try yeah it, it, I, I cannot find the English word but uh, yeah to to consider what they read with more doubt and attention and in this uh, you know uh, holds uh, both for preprints uh, and uh, scientific literature in general as regards the media yeah I think there is also a strong responsibility in how you know the the journalists communicate uh, communicate science there there should be, you know, more uh, attention in how uh, this is done. Uh, but it, it goes a little bit outside my my field or my my training, my preparation. So um, I don't have nothing more uh, to say about that. And and, and regarding the. Um, the need for help basically in doing data management. I would like to show if I can uh, just one slide about that. That is taken from, uh, well, another presentation. Uh, let me, yeah, okay, this one. Can you see it? Yeah, well, uh, the, the, yeah, that is, it is in Italian, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, because I did it, uh, well, I presented it in an Italian, um, conference. And it is about the roles and competences of data stewards, this, you know, new professional figures that should be introduced in research institutions to help the scientists in doing data management correctly. Okay. And uh, well, what, um, what I found interesting is you exactly mentioned those three aspects that are important. So the availability of infrastructures, that there could be software, hardware services, technical infrastructures in, uh, in a way of, you know, uh, availability, not only of databases, of repositories, but also of developers, of people that can help you build the right infrastructure to support data management. And then the element of policy of requirements, uh, guidelines that come from on top, okay, partly bottom up and partly uh, top down, okay, so people that can you know, talk to funders and university boards and policymakers and define policies and guidelines for specific data use cases, so help with GDPR and so on. And another aspect is how to implement all this in research. Those, there should be at least three different kinds of new professional figures of technicians, of data stewards, call it whatever you want, but that can help uh, researchers in doing that. Uh, because I understand that this is something that you cannot learn, you know, just like that, okay? It's it's something that must be done or should be done at a professional level. So I think that in every institution, in every university, there should be a plan, okay, in order to develop this, this level of support. 
And there should also be some guidelines at the national level uh, and not only international, of course. Okay. We have a question in the chat. I will read it out loud if it's okay. Um, so given that the open science framework is more time consuming, could you share some practical adv advice about how to deal with the institutional pressure, so the publish or perish verdict, without giving up on the main pillars such as sharing methods, code or data, or rather, how do institutions, yours or any other institution facilitate this approach? Yeah, I think that the answer to this question was also partly in what I uh, already said. Okay, um, you need support. Okay, this is not something because, you know, uh, with in, in these last years, uh, the the profession of of of, of the scientist of, of the researcher. Okay. Uh, really it has become more and more committing and more complex because you are required you know to write grants and to be competent in communication in dissemination in innovation in uh, you know uh, ip in uh, technology transfer in uh, you know data management and so on and so on so with the with the uh, it, 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 it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to, to become expert and to be competent in all of these fields. So, to, so I think that is important that uh, this concept uh, passes that you need support, you need a good level, a good infrastructure of uh, uh, support services to research, support in communication, support in uh, grant writing, support uh, in data management. Then you, you, you have to, you know, to acquire a minimum level of these soft skills in order to be able to, you know, interact with people from the support services, but then you need some professional help. Okay, and uh, well, um, uh, since you know uh, some years ago, the technology transfer was not you know part of the research support. Now it is. We need to build a new level of support also for data management, a first line support that is uh, that comes from the data stewards and the data managers also uh, as regards the the management of research data. Okay, thank you very much, Valentina. Does anyone else have any other questions? A new message, okay, no. So if if I may, uh, I would like sure. just to, to say one, one more thing. Um, uh, well, since uh, many of you are uh, PhD students, I understood you work in the field of, of neuroscience. Uh, I uh, invite you to keep an eye on the IIT website uh, in the following months, uh, because we plan to publish at the beginning of the next year, uh, a call for applications for uh, an award, a PhD uh, thesis award uh, that will be um, specifically intended for um, PhD thesis in the neuroscience field that combine open science methodologies with the quality uh, of research in the neuroscience field. Okay. Uh, and um, these, uh, well, the motivation for this award is both. Uh, uh, well, IIT uh, intention to support the development of open science among uh, PhD students in the field of neuroscience, but also because we would like to remember in memory of a young PhD student, uh, Pedro Lagomarsino de Leon Roig, that uh, well, unfortunately passed away last year uh, uh, suddenly because of an accident. And he was uh, really, uh, really 
really, you know, uh, committed to open science. He tried to apply open science during his uh, PhD studies, and we would like also to remember uh, remember him and and you know uh, and. Uh, for his memory, uh, and we we will be publishing this uh, call for applications. So it's for PhD students in neurosciences. So please keep an eye on the website because we will publish this in the following months. That's it. Okay. Thank you again. I think it's a really great opportunity. Somebody asks if the IT Iran will forward this call. When it comes out, I think why can. not? Why not? If you wish, from my point of view, but it's up to you. I will let you know. <laughs> okay, you, then we will. Then I will just uh, put up our closing slides. Okay, so uh, it's all, it's already four, it's nine minutes past four, so it's really <laughs> time for uh, closing up. Thank you again, Valentina. It is really, it was really motivating. I want to reiterate this because it's really, I really liked your talk. Um, thank you. Thank you, Christine. A, a few uh, final information for um, a little bit of final information for people uh, listening. Uh, first thing, um, for those who asked it, the, the, you will receive as an email that certificates your attendance to this talk. Um, it will uh, you will receive it in approximately one week from uh, from today. So if you asked it, just please just wait one week. If you don't receive it in one week, then. Uh, you can contact us and ask for it. This year, as we already communicated to all the schools uh, of uh, all, all the doctoral schools, the only um, participation um, certificate that we will give is this email. There, there will be no other uh, forms of uh, certificate. So. Um, and also, I want to make you um, to draw your attention to two things. Uh, first, uh, our next uh, meeting, the general meeting of ITRN, will be in Rome the 24th of uh, February of um, next year. So please uh, uh, write down this date on your calendar, it's the 24th of February. Also, the next month's speaker is Nicholas Coles. Uh, Nicholas Coles is the uh, director of the uh, Psychological Science Accelerator. He will speak about uh, multi-lab and multi-site projects. So it's it will be very interesting, I think, especially for uh, young researchers, for the PhD students, for instance, because uh, yeah, it's a great opportunity to take part to multi-lab studies and multi-site studies. It's a great way to begin your research, to learn the practices, to to take part also to very interesting studies. So uh, I, I really suggest you to uh, take part to next meeting. And uh, um, also, uh, as usual, we will uh, upload the registration of this uh, uh, video on YouTube, uh, and uh, you will receive an e email when uh, the video is uh, uploaded. And uh, I think it's uh, that's it for today. So thank you all for being here and see you in a month. Bye-bye.